Welcome everybody to a next live session, a workshop for Beyond Extend. Happy to have you all here. There's a lot of people this time, so it's good to see everyone just popping in. But this time we're here with Jasmine Habazai Fekri, and she's going to talk about stylized texture creation, the workflow that she personally uses for all her amazing art pieces. She's currently like a 3D environment artist at the Airship Syndicate where she's probably creating like even more awesome art. So look forward to when that comes out. <laughs> yeah, some, some additional notes for people that are new. We use the live session chat for questions. Jasmine will also be answering questions during the presentation. So if you have a question, feel free to just ask it between, um, put question between bracket and then have your question behind it because it's easier for us to filter through the questions that way. Um, let's think, anything else? No, I don't think so. We're good to go. Uh, yeah, Jasmine, I'll hand it over to you. Have fun. Okay. <laughs> so, hey everyone again. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk you through how I personally create my textures and um, yeah, just give you a little insight into my day-to-day -day workflow that I did for all of my personal projects. Um, yeah, it's constantly developing, but this is like the current stance on my things. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy seeing that. But just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a 3D environment artist at Airship Syndicate currently. Before that, I've freelanced for Monomy Park and uh, Airborne Studios on stylized projects and um, during the same time I also went to university and got my degree in um, digital games and um, yeah as some of you might know during that time I was mostly very occupied with learning 3D, um, finding my own style, um, cross-referencing a lot of games and um, yeah that's where I'm today with my <laughs> current like visual approaches. Uh, I personally really like to make anything that's really colorful bright and sunny and you know having like exaggerated shapes but still being rooted in realism um i personally never really dabbled into anything realistic but i still really enjoy referencing a lot of realistic work or like what i see around myself in my daily life uh, where i live or where i travel to um but yeah i will kind of go into how important it is actually to reference from like realistic stuff as well but that will be coming up um but yeah how do i start making stylized textures um the first step which might be obvious to uh, most of you is gathering references but for me that's like uh the, ta the the step that takes quite a long time i would say even the longest time um because during that you will have to figure out what is the direction you want to take with your works um is there any specific game you want to maybe emulate or is there do you want to develop your own style but yeah i'll go into that further in a bit um the second step which is obvious probably is too <laughs> is i sculpt uh, all of my details inside zbrush um i won't be going into like the block out phase because blocking out the actual model is not really that important for the textures themselves um Obviously, you have to have a solid base where you can actually start sculpting on, but um, that's like its own thing, like, you know, to have uh, interesting shape language, to, you know, um, have it to have the scale uh, on par with what you have it inside engine. Um, but I think that's like a whole nother beast to tackle, so I'm not going to go into that today. Um, but yeah, for ZBrush, uh, I will probably show you like some uh, tips and tricks that I personally like to apply with all of my assets that I make. and. Um, that's personally for me also the most time intensive um, step of my workflow. I spend a lot of time inside ZBrush because you can get a lot of great detailing and um, like base work done for your models inside there and save a lot of time in the actual uh, substance painter process, which is step three in my workflow. Um, I personally prefer painter over designer. Um, I occasionally like to integrate some designer into my workflow for, you know, some uh, height maps that I create and create inside there, or um, just adding some like additional color variation, especially for uh, tiling textures. But um, for 99% of the time, I stay inside Substance Painter um, and add like some micro detailing, the main colors, of course, and the finishing touches of the um, textures. 
Well, yeah, let's go back to step one, uh, gathering references. Um, I kind of like to group my reference uh, search um, expedition, which is first going into real life references, looking what exists already inside games or other media like movies, uh, animation films, um, even like miniature figures. That's like a big thing for me to look into sometimes, like people who make little Dungeons and Dragons figurines or environment sets in real life with board games. That's super inspiring to me. And uh, your own goals for the project. Um, with some of the projects I've made in the past, uh, especially during my time at university, I did want to copy, not necessarily copy, but um, be inspired or see how specific games that I look up to um, get to the style that they are creating. And obviously you're not going to always be able to 100% nail it because, you know, each studio has like their own tips and tricks that they apply, but you can already get quite a lot by just uh, intensely looking at the screenshots that they are or even the breakdowns that some people like uh, share on art station of their props and stuff you can already get quite a lot out of that so um, that's how I usually would then create my own goal for the project um, I'll actually now go into mirror because that's a lot easier and just kind of um, show like three different projects and the way I've been gathering references for them um, one project that was really like fun for me to do was my um, library um, piece. With that one, I was partly trying to copy stuff, or not copy, but like, yeah, as I said, emulate things like um, in Darksiders because they have a lot of the Gothic type architecture with the archers and a lot of like micro detailing on the um, damage of the stone. And I thought that was really cool in the, the overall mood of that. And um, Dark's Book is like another um, game which uh, Larry Kummer did a lot of cool prop creation for it. I really liked how effortlessly he just had like a tiny bit of like sculpting details and all of the information that you can see later on in the textures of like the actual wood information comes from these sculpts. The only thing that he added on later on is probably the um, slight color variation and some... Um, uh, curvature and uh, cavity like uh, paint overs but as you can see it the sculpt really carries these pieces at the end um looking at real life references i basically for my own arches here i looked into actual drawings from like back in uh 1300s <laughs> from uh architects back in the time who were designing like the um church arches and i think they were super helpful it's basically like having concept art already on hand that you can also use for modeling references and just put it inside your preferred modeling program in the back and model of that. But also for seeing how um, the stone like wears off um, when it's like breaking off in the parts or like looking at um, current um, states of these buildings and see if they're still um, intact or how they actually break maybe after some while because most of these windows are pretty well constructed that not a lot of damage happens to them but then there's also a lot of ruin type uh, places which I had in my very untidy section of my uh, mood board that uh, break off maybe a bit more uh, but as you can see even in this really old building there's still not a lot happening damaging wise but yeah I still really like to look how the cracks are like interacting on the intersecting parts because that will be super helpful for sculpting later and um the actual stone damage but i also looked at stuff like overwatch where the detailing is very low in that regard like you just see some slight chipping on these edges um but not actual huge damages like you would see in a dark siders game for example which was my the, the reference i was looking at the most and that's like the end product as you can see uh, during this project, I've kind of developed my own approach of this. Like when you see this, this couldn't be inside Darksiders uh, directly or inside Overwatch or inside another game, but it still kind of grabs the inspirations from the different um, games that I looked at. Um, but then like looking at something very small, like a prop, like with this, I just wanted to make a little um, Shiba Inu um, stone uh, asset based on my own dog. <laughs> And uh, with this one, I did a lot of real life um, reference gathering of plants, but also little miniatures of like uh, Totoro or wood sculptures, because there, uh, for a while, I wanted to make it actually a wooden sculpture. And there, I really like the way 
these real life sculptures did this almost chiseled effect that you do see a lot of people do inside zeros with trim dynamic or trim adaptive um i was like yeah this is going to be super easy to do inside zeros but um at the same time i was also looking at things that are not necessarily the same material but um have like an interesting shape language but as i said this goes more back into um the modeling aspect and not the texturing aspect per se but um then i obviously also looked at a lot of pre-existing games in media like in league of legends this fox statue was super cool because it was basically doing what i really wanted to achieve with that being like a standalone statue but also in dota um with the actual dog um Korea, which is not stone necessary, but it still was an interesting reference of how like fur might be sculpted in to there. Um, and then like a little last excurs to um, my one of my older projects, the uh, marketplace. Um, here I did mostly reference either uh, Ghibli or the concept itself or Overwatch because um, Overwatch, as, as you, all of you probably already know, does a really good job as achieving a lot with very little uh, micro detailing. Like when you look at this wood, you straight away just see these wood grains that have been obviously sculpted in and some little indents um, and then the color just uh, having like some slight variation. That's it, which is on paper, like uh, pretty straightforward to do. And um, that's what is like my main rule with a lot of things are texture. I like to keep it simple, but still um, varying and interesting enough to look at, but not too busy and too overly detailed. Because this wood, for example, you can see it a lot of times in this um, environment. You don't really need to spend hours and hours to like sculpt every single wood grain. You just need like some hints or like some subtle, um, yeah, uh, reminders to the viewer that this is wood. But uh, it doesn't need to like repeatedly be visible. And this is like, if I look at these, obviously, uh, like I think with this project, I learned that I shouldn't like worry too much about the specific assets themselves. So I look maybe textures because this was all done with trim sheets and tiling textures. But them being like kind of simple, it's all together, they look a lot more complex than. I thought at the start. So you don't really need to have super complex textures to make something look nice as long as the you hit the right spot of details and uh, the colors and they harmonize together, you already like are basically um hitting it on the nail. I think like uh, don't spend too much time on worrying too much about uh, getting every single thing 100% accurate or um right. But yeah, that's that's more on like the tiling texture side. But um, today I'll be more going into like this kind of direction of how I do it with um, specific props. Um, but yeah, going back to um, the actual sculpting aspect, um, I've got like some key pillars of how I approach my sculpt. Um, there's on one hand the detail treatment, where obviously you go from big to small always. Um, the way I treat materials themselves, what's the characteristic of each material, because wood looks different to stone, to metal and foliage, and um, what specific shapes and tools are unique to ZBrush that you can um, utilize and make use of that a model looks handcrafted versus procedural. That's why I personally always like to stay inside ZBrush and not make use of too many procedural um, uh, generators and stuff like that, only later on maybe to get some extra detail inside Painter, but um, having that slight look of imperfection even inside your sculpt um, really sells that um, more exaggerated and disconnected from reality um, uh, look. I actually just saw that uh, Paul asked a question and we're already here. I could maybe answer this. Um, Environments and textures have very strong visual appeal. I know this is tricky to answer, and there are maybe lots of different factors. But have you uh, have any tips on how to make work more appealing? Um, I think one thing I always ask myself, and I can go back to the mirror for that, is to whenever I make something, I look at it and think, is this chunky enough? Um, do I have too many unnecessary, like thin um, edges, maybe? Uh, when I zoom out from it, can I? See, is this like bevel big enough? And I think with a lot of work that might not look as appealing, sometimes the problem is 
that uh, people tend to, um, it's very stylized stuff, I don't want to speak for other art styles, but like with stylized stuff, people tend to maybe make the detailing way too small or way too thin and it looks a bit too um, fragile. I think with something like this, where it's like a broken arch, you can make it look a bit more fragile. But um, overall, the shapes should be chunky and big. Like if you look at this arch from far away, you can clearly tell that these rocks are separated from each other because of the big bevel, like the, the slightly bigger bevels and the thinner bevels. It's like having a mix of big to small bevels, but not having everything look super small and thin and sharp. Like you have to have sharp and smooth, big and thin. It's like having a good balance between both. And um, that's what you can, I think, achieve with having a sculpted base, because I sometimes also see that um, people maybe skip the sculpting part and just jump straight into painter with a um, low poly mesh, or like just have a very simple bake of a high poly that they maybe made in a 3D program. But I think uh, a lot of stylized work can look a lot more appealing if you have that Baked base, especially in these examples from Larry Kuma, I really looked at them for a long time in the past years, was that all of the edges, even the ones where he didn't um, like use a trim dynamic or something, it's still slightly beveled and smooth, but sharp at the same time. And that gives you in the bake, like the really appealing like edge definition where the two edges meet, but it's not just, just razor sharp. There's actually like some space for the curvature to shine and you can say, okay, um, there's some ex exaggerated look of um, where the wood is like chipping off basically. I hope this makes sense. If not, please uh, let me know. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, that's, that's awesome. Um, can I just quickly interrupt? We also have yeah. um, a question from Nikita and from Peter. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. That. Yeah. I, I'll go. Oh, yes. I just saw. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, um, it's all good. Um, how long did it take you to develop your own texturing style and how does it differ at all from your modeling uh, sculpting style? Um, I think developing my texture style took probably like roughly two, two or three years, like the entire time I was at university, because uh, if some of you might know my work, um, if you look at my portfolio, just to quickly go on there. I used to do um, a lot of hand painted art, and that was like a different, completely different uh, texturing approach to what I do now. Um, for example, back then I would have a sculpted base, but I would probably ignore it very early on into painting and just paint over my uh, bakes. Or sometimes I would have no bake base, which is like this one, and I would just paint straight away. And in this time, I think I've kind of solidified my hand painted style, but then I started to jump into PBR, which was like these pieces of the marketplace. Um, and with these, I just knew that I really like what Overwatch is doing or how Ghibli movies are looking or Darksiders and um, these kind of games. But I didn't really know how I can do it. So I would just go for it and <laughs> kind of test different things. And I think comparing, for example, the market entrance piece and my Hip Hop Bura Sanctuary, I changed my um, I'm sorry, the projects are a bit too big for art station to load. Okay. Um, I changed my texturing style quite a bit from this. Like, I still like to keep things soft and um, not overly detailed things. Like you don't see a lot of uh, height information in these things, for example, or not over like strong normals. That's like another thing I um, like to do with my style. But in this, I've went a lot more into actually um, spending time in painter and texturing things more detailed, which I will show later on as well. And learned more about uh, utilizing my sculpts better because in the market entrance piece, I barely sculpted anything. It was all just tiling textures and maybe occasionally having like a sculpted prop or um, nothing else. And in this piece, I sculpted everything except maybe the brick texture in the back. So I think it takes quite a while to develop that. But with that, at the same time, I did develop my modeling and sculpting style as well, especially for sculpting, because a lot of my, um, textures, which I will explain as well, heavily depend on the sculpts that I've made. So it, it kind of goes hand in hand and then hand in hand. And then the modeling develops at the same time too, because I find new ways to maybe have a more solid base that I can sculpt on and don't change the shapes too much. And then it gets kind of like a faster process. It's hard to explain. It's a, a very organic um, development, I would say. Um, and another question was, would you make Italian textures in Painter as well? 
a Final Faster than Designer. Um, yeah, I actually did do some of my tiling textures inside Painter. Um, an example for that would be um, the concrete on this on the Hofepopura sanctuary, for example. You can barely tell because it's a very simple <laughs> texture. Um, but I had a very weird process for this. Like I sculpted it a bit, and then I put it in Painter, and then I put it in Designer and changed something, exported the height map, and put it inside Painter <laughs> again. Um, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's best to do what's fast for you and what you think gives you the best results. Because I used to think oh, I need to learn designer perfectly to, you know, be a good environment artist. But at this point, I am much more comfortable just to stay inside ZBrush and or even go inside Photoshop and do like a very mixed media process that probably uh, is not very like standardized in that sense, but it gives me the results I like. So I think at the end of the day, just go for what you feel comfortable with and gives you a pretty result that is workable as well. Like it's like a different thing. Again, if you work inside a studio and you want people to, you know, be able to go into your files and do like a different iteration of it. In that case, design is a lot more usable, but I think for your own projects or wanting to experiment, uh, just go for whatever you think, um, fits best for your um, style that you want to achieve with the project. Um, oh yeah, I hope this I answered it somehow. If you guys have any follow-up questions to these things, uh, please let me know in the chat and I'll keep an eye on it while I'm talking. <laughs> but um, yeah, just to jump into ZBrush, um, I wanted to explain some stuff how I do things here. Because, yeah, there are some things inside ZBrush that are unique to it that you can do a lot with. And, um, like, spoiler alert, I don't do a lot of very magical or <laughs> um, very unusual stuff in there. Like, my go-to tool is the Mask Lasso tool, um, Trim Dynamic, and some of the orb brushes that I like to, um, just to emphasize details, but I'll just show that. Um, just a simple example, um, I've got this cube here that I zero mesh and tapered a bit. Um, another thing about modeling, actually, I do like to adjust my models a bit inside ZBrush as well, especially with the um, deformation tab inside here. The taper is I'm just gonna do that. The taper tool is my best friend. Like, if you want to do super exaggerated, like exaggerated wooden boards, that's all I do. I just do them inside here, scale them up a bit, and then start sculpting. This might be a bit too much, but let's go for it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the mask blaster tool is something I use all the time to do shapes. I'll just show you like an example how I do it with uh, wood. Um, but I also use this for metal and for stones and basically any material. It just depends how you integrate the details. With wood, you will you would like to do like bigger shapes like this, and then use the move brush to um, pull out the edge a bit. With this, this is like the thing I mentioned earlier. You have to make sure, this also depends on the style you're going for, but this is my personal approach, is that I like to keep this edge um, fairly chunky because sometimes people maybe just do this and then you have this super sharp edge, which is nice looking as well. But for the style that I want to, want to go for, is it's good to keep things a bit more smooth and subtle looking, and especially having this like little transition where it fades out, this will bake very nicely actually. And then what I basically do is I draw these um, random shapes and sometimes I do sharpen the mask a bit, but I feel like this also depends on personal preference. It might look a bit too sharp, which is also maybe nice to do, but um, yeah, that's what I basically do. I do never do the live demo while talking, I'm really bad at talking and arting at the same time. I'm the most quiet person in Hangouts usually. <laughs> um, but yeah, for the wooden grain, I always like to keep the most detailed areas on the edges of the, uh, of the board, for example, in this case, and then keep the middle fairly um, chilled out because uh, let's say this is going to be like part of a tiling texture for like a wooden floorboard, which I also like to do. I always like to make my wood floors inside ZBrush as well, just with the, um, the deformation tab and offsetting things on the X axis. Um, but yeah, then I'll just pull this out. And then we want to have like a nice silhouette for this very simple wooden board. Do this. 
Oh yeah, that, that, I like this where you can get like these very chunky bevels in here. You don't even need to like lay down and retopo retopo this edge. You could because it has like a nice uh, silhouette, but you don't have to. Um, and then to get like nicer uh, wood grains, you could use an orb slash. Turn off the back face mask because you hate doing like a front of a wooden beam and then on the back you suddenly have all the very ugly um, inverted slash things. But yeah, I also like to play with the intensity of these and then it's a bit too low now. Um, and just intensify these shapes that I've done with the lasso tool. Um, yeah. And then if you want, if, uh, you could just do like a couple of slashes like on the side like this or on the bottom. But I wouldn't go crazy with this. Like what I personally wouldn't do is just doing like these random things on the middle. I've seen this before where people just like to use the op um, brushes for everything and then you just like go a bit too like overboard with it but it that's not how wood works like I would really try to do a little bit of storytelling even with, when it's a, just a simple piece of wood like maybe think about where this wooden thing is is it like leaning onto something where people have been like putting it on the floor on this specific place several times that's why it's worn down on that place or um is it like super weathered or is it in a place where stones are falling on top of it and it has like these little indents on the middle of it or something like just think about why you're adding the damage that you are adding to a thing like with any prop not just with wood like with anything you're making i wouldn't just add like a you know a chiseled edge to it just because i like to have a chiseled edge there right now like you can do that i do that sometimes too but it's good to think about it maybe before why we're doing specific things the way we do. Um, and another thing I like to use is the clip curve. I'm sure a lot of you guys use this as well. Um, to add some silhouette changes to this. I know this is more into like the modeling aspect again, but this will also give you a super nice bake later on uh, on the edge of it and then bleed into here to you know, add some interest to the texture itself as well. So, um, I, this process always takes me the longest time because I never know from what angle I want this. Like this is too much, and I end up doing something else. But <laughs> like I, I could spend hours just sculpting and undoing what I'm trying to do. So um, yeah, and then you can blend it out a bit, and then you can add these little indents in some places and then even here i like to use the um, mask lasso again and um, you can do the same technique with this without using the move brush you could just do with this and then you get some tiny bit more organic shapes like here this uh, wood grain is now a bit um, wavy in a sense which you don't want to do but i do this usually for stone which i can demonstrate in a second as well um so yeah that's this um and then for little circles and stuff like i've done here you could also mask this out and then just utilize like the negative space you have now and just do a little indent here and then it looks a bit more interesting and faded out um or you can just fill it again like i also like to use alt and then hold alt and then paint so you can fill these spaces up again if it's like a bit too much and then see oh well, yeah that was a not nicely placed wood grain to me but <laughs> we're gonna leave it there um but yeah to be honest uh my sculpting process is basically just this like i just you like overuse the mask mask tool uh for everything i sculpt <laughs> that's the my go-to like i can show you another more intense example like this is this infuser i made for the hippo um place and this one's made entirely out of metal and as you can see all this is also based on the um masking tool where i just go a bit more you know wiggly and oh, this one's already um kind of meshed uh, but yeah i'll go a bit like this and then you can do again the masking and do stuff like this like that's 
So that's the same technique we just did with a piece of wood. But you can do the same with um, metal as well. And even like all these shapes are obviously with a um, transform symmetry where you paint them out and then you pull them out again. And then around them at the end, I would do all these like little chisels like here where a bit of the metal might be chipping off or rusting or, you know, something fell on top of this infuser at some point in its lifetime and um, yeah, chipping off or like scratching on these things. And as you can see, I did also use these typical op slash brushes on here, but just on the edges where maybe the sections are intact. Um, into um, locking with the next um, part of the metal thing. <laughs> My vocabulary for how metal infuses work is not that excited, but you know what I mean? Like when um, an object has like new intersections coming in, you want to kind of um, show if there's maybe some damage done to it. And in some cases I would even, you know, underneath of this, you can see that I've done some Chipping and some intercept uh, in, inset um, there as well, just to you know um, make it look like they've been fused together. And after a while, the rust um, is spreading from that part because that's the part where maybe there might be some air coming through or the metal just aging quicker because there's not that connection like you would have on like a flat, like a um, complete surface on here. Um, but yeah, as you can see for metal, it's a bit more straightforward. I also like to use some brushes, like for example, um, these brushes by this artist called SV. I can link um, them later on. Um, but he does some really cool, like little details like this, or which one was it? This one, like this hammered look, which you could also do yourself with like a pinch brush and, um, or even like making your own alphas. But I think it's sometimes useful to have these tools where you can, you know, use this brush and then use H polish and make it bleed into your sculpt a bit better. Like I would never just drag this on and be like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this and then do this and then done. Like, I think that looks kind of forced and not integrated into your model. I would always try to, you know, blend it out a bit, you know, add like your own little indents here and there, like, just don't use these brushes. Don't don't abuse them too much, please. Like that's my main uh, call for this uh, type of stuff. Just be very subtle with them. Use them whenever you want, and be aware of your scale. Like this, I I, I personally have to say, in retrospect, I went a bit nuts with this um, infuser. It's tiny. Like if I can go into the mama set, um, like. The player is probably like double the size of this infuser. And this little infuser is maybe the size of a head. <laughs> it's very small, but I just wanted to flex a bit my sculpting and texturing skills just to be honest now here, but it, it's still very small. But if you zoom out, these little details that you add where the metal is coming off are really paying off. Like you can actually see, okay, this infuser is not old. There's some damage done to it. It's not the best the newest and shiniest thing out there, but in its heyday, it might have been pretty expensive. And that's what you can do with having just these little slashes and um, insets. And as you can see, that's what I mean, that you get a nice beveled look in the bake later that um, yeah, makes it uh, a lot more um, exciting to look at. Um, but I will also show you later how you can actually fake some of these things inside Painter as well. You don't have to always micro detail this all inside Z. Um, and the last mat uh, material treatment I could show would be, um, let's see, for plants. That's what I wanted to take this off file. Um, to save this. Sorry, guys. Um, I wish you could have several tabs of ZBrush open. That's my pet peeve. Um, yeah, with plants, I just wanted to stress this. Plants are very straightforward and simple on my end. Like I spend the most time sculpting wood. Like as you see, I would spend probably the next three hours just doing some uh, more lasso tooling and whatever. But for plants, I just um, take the plane, draw, draw out a shape, extract it, and then start um, sculpting on it. As you can see, I literally just take the, um, where is it? The orb cracks brush and then just paint on, like paint the 
actual veins of the plant and maybe use some uh, H polish, but I wouldn't go overboard with that either because you don't want plants to look like stone suddenly, that they have chipped edges and stuff like that. Like that's that's not necessary, but still since it's stylized, I do like to exaggerate maybe where a plant would have had a cut or like a little, um, you know, when like plants get discolored or maybe a book like was eating through it. Like that's what I wanted to indicate on this leaf, for example, with this slight uh, uh, wrong brush. Uh, indent here that I've done with H polish, obviously. But yeah, with plants, you can keep it simple as possible. With this, I think I'll just use the OBS cracks brush and um, some pinching to like pinch the leaves on here, and that's it. For roots and stuff, like especially for trees, it's a bit of a different story here. If like this is obviously a very um, simple branch that you wouldn't want to like draw in actual wood grains in like this, but even with wood grains on a tree, you can get away with just using an OBS cracks brush, um, maybe a damn standard to um, uh, elevate the, the heights of the trunk going up and down. But um, you can get away with just using these two brushes and maybe inflate and move to indicate the little muscular shapes of the um, wood. And I know this is like going back into the modeling territory, but especially with plants, since they are baked onto a flat plane, you have to make up for the fact that these are flat and um, or you have to try your best basically to make them look as 3D as possible uh, in uh, your 2D plane. So yeah, for plants, I think plants are honestly the most easiest thing to sculpt. And I personally would also say for stylized stuff, don't go insane with them and don't sculpt every like uh, vein and uh, like, cracking it like I've seen people sculpting st um, plants that look very stony or metally like you have to keep it very organic and having like these smooth surfaces where it looks um, luscious and um, organic um, and not like a rock-esque uh, um, mesh. And there's another question. Uh, how do you decide what details to include in your sculpting and what to include in your texturing? That's a really good point. Um, let me just go back into um, the infuser projects. I think that's easier to explain. Um, so for the infuser, for example, I'm sure there are people who would sculpt um, these shapes, uh, would make these shapes inside Painter. That's perfectly reasonable. I personally thought, um, I will do them in ZBrush because ZBrush will give me a nicer beveled look for them if I um, sculpt them. And it would also um, give me the opportunity to add like these little indents if I want to. Um, and like having these type of details, I also would always do them in ZBrush because painting, quote unquote, inside ZBrush is for me a lot easier than doing that in Painter, in Substance Painter. In Substance Painter, you could also paint these things into your height map. Um, and I'm sure that's possible, but I would rather do all of that inside um, ZBrush and then later inside Painter. I can already jump into that maybe, so it's um, easier to explain. Um, this is my infuser inside Painter right now. In Painter, the only thing I've done was adding um, these type of like tiling um, damages because I didn't feel like if you mirror even this, you would still need to spend time to sculpt like these micro details. Um, things inside ZBrush and that would take much too much time and you know maybe you don't like the amount of details that you have there and then you have the difficulty to paint them out inside the normal map and that gets like into very icky <laughs> um, territory so I think my rule of thumb would be to sculpt in your base details like the main characteristics of the object that you see in the texture for example for the infuser it was these little shapes these fan like shapes or these ornamental um, tiling shapes, or even like the chipped damage on here that you can see straight away when you look at this object from far away. But for all of the very micro detailing things like the surface um, damage and little <laughs> dents that I've got here, just do them inside Painter because um, there you can actually control where you want this amount of damage, where you don't want it. Do you suddenly feel like, oh, this looks too noisy, I will paint it out. And then if you do that in ZBrush, it gets, you know, a lot more annoying because you have to start baking it again. <clears throat> um, 
but yeah, I think it's it's difficult. Like, even I sometimes realize, oh, I could have done this inside Paint. I've wasted time, you know, sculpting this all inside ZBrush. But it, I think it always pays off having your big to medium details inside ZBrush, and then for the tiny tiny things, you can just do that inside Substance Painter and um, spend some time with the generators, which I will um, go walk you through. Which are my height. Uh, not like my height information that I like to add into my Substance Painter files. Um, question, where do you spend the most time when working on your personal work? Um, I think the most time I spend on is the last 10% of it, or like even the last 5%, because that's the time where I would go back and forth between, um, let's go back onto, like this example for you. like here, I didn't spend that much time actually texturing this or sculpting these. The most time I was spending was actually um, putting them all together inside engine. And then at the end being like, oh, this arch doesn't look like it has enough detail and then go back into painter and adding more detail. And that's the point where it's easier to just have everything inside substance painter, because if I would have to open my ZBrush file again and, you know, change like this micro detail that I want to add suddenly, I would have to sit and bake this out once again, and yeah, you know, it, you just save like maybe an hour of time by just doing it inside a procedural thing. But yeah, I think the, the longest time I do spend is on polishing everything because I'm starting a project, like my reference time and like gathering and figuring out how I'm going to build an environment takes a long time for me. Like I have to sit and, you know, actually have a um, battle plan like placed out in front of me to be like, okay, I can do this. You can actually see this also with um, this project I've done. I had to like kind of make it look easier in my head because looking at this environment, I was like, I'm going to probably spend now months making this. It's going to be impossible to make. But then I'm like, oh, okay, this is actually just a couple of tiling textures. But actually sitting there and making a list for yourself of the things you need is a thing that should be time spent on. And it's the longest I need to figure out in my head. Some people are super you know, straightforward in this and be like, oh yeah, this is so easy. I can do this this way. I can make this type of trim sheet and, you know, but I need to actually spend maybe a week or two to, you know, make it make sense in my head. And then when it makes sense, I'm like, okay, I'm, I've got the confidence to now move forward with this because then you also don't run into that many roadblocks when you're actually in the process of making it and realize, oh shit, I should have maybe spend a couple more days sitting there and, you know, prototyping stuff instead of now making my final sculpt that I've now worked on for two or three days. And suddenly I realized this trim doesn't work at all, or this prop is super detailed and it looks kind of whack in the environment. So, um, yeah, just, just take your time. Like it pays off being a bit slower on that regard and not starting straight away by opening blender and modeling the whole thing. Like it's good to take um what's your favorite part of the entire environment art creation process my favorite part is probably being inside zbrush like this <laughs> i really like having you know my block arts ready and then just sitting there and being able to be super nitpicky and sculpt this stuff um like i was saying like with this even with simple stuff like a piece of wood it really gives me a lot of joy just being creative and being able to you know have like these super fancy shapes in there and like seeing that this cube is can, can like look exciting and like a piece of wood. <laughs> I'm very simple in that regard. Um, and the texturing, like nowadays, uh, texturing is more technical in my head because I've got my set materials and I always use them and I always, um, you know, I, I still adjust them obviously and the colors and my, you know, the generators and paint my own stuff inside of the textures as well. But I think sculpting is still like my favorite aspect of everything because I can be super creative about it, not think about retopo or optimization or, you know, uh, being super technical. It's much more hands on um, art in that sense in my head. And uh, lighting. Lighting is also something I really enjoy doing because in my personal lighting setups are always very um, like currently more outdoor places where you don't need to worry too much about baking light. Like this one was a bit more tricky because I had to have a lot of uh, reflection captures and a lot of like point lights to fake things. 
So that was still very fun to me because uh, lighting can make like such a huge difference in how even your textures look and how your model looks. And it, like even in stuff like here in Marmoset, I really love doing just these little lighting setups where I have this blue rim light or like light coming in, but this warm light on the front, like it really is satisfying to see how nice a prop can look with the right light setup. Because that's also the thing I want to touch upon is that in Substance Painter, you can be easily, like, I think you all experience this, that in Substance Painter, a thing looks like this, and you put it inside Marmoset, it looks like this, and then you go inside, um, you know, Unreal Engine, and it looks like, this is me just breaking it, like this, like, it's completely different. <laughs> That's like a bit frustrating, but I always think, okay, what's the main engine I want to show this in? It's it's Unreal Engine, so I'm going to make it look good inside Unreal Engine, and I don't care if it looks maybe not as shiny anymore inside Substance Painter because I'm not going to render this inside Substance Painter. And that's how it is. Like, uh, don't get too caught up on how your like roughness values look like inside in here. And you're like, oh, this is, you know, too too rough for me, but like inside Unreal, it's not. So what am I going to do? What's the right way to go about it? I think it's just, just see what feels right and what looks right to you because these programs are tricking you. <laughs> and it's like, um, never ending battle to make it work in all of them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I th now I'm completely lost track, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, if I, that's, I think all I do inside zero stand where I explain like favorite brush is just using the masking, uh, lasso with move, um, Trim, dynamic, H polish, and that's it for me. And then sometimes, obviously, you know, intensifying the cracks with uh, some of the odd brushes. Um, and for stone, um, I do like to use the trim dynamic ones, like here. Like if you do stuff like this, suddenly to this thing, it looks a bit more stony because as it looks a lot more chiseled, and stone is very chiseled in some cases. Um, like, I wouldn't do this stuff with wood because it, it just looks way too aggressive, I think. And wood, in my head, is always very smooth and, you know, um, just in my interpretation. Like, obviously, you can have also have aggressive wood that's on you. But for me, I would like to have these smooth bevels. But if you have that on a rock, um, you should always have that on a rock, too. But in, less, uh, in, in a less uh, intense way that you then you would have like on a piece of wood where it's a bit more smooth in its um, characteristic at least. That's a different thing again for realistic wood. Realistic wood can is like not like this, but uh, for stylized stuff, I really like to keep it smooth for wood. But yeah, for stone, um, it's much more chiseled. And then even for stone, you can do stuff like with the um, move brush, but then I change my curve depth into acute curve and then to make it a bit more like sharp the indents that are coming out. Um oh yeah no that's that's all blue now sorry. Um but yeah at the end of the day I just use the same techniques for that but just on a different shape or um even in, more intensely on stone, I would just do a lot more of the clip curve stuff, which I think most people do for stones. It's, um, yeah, putting off the edges and um, make it look like stone or, or make it look insane. Uh, oh, yeah, no. <laughs> I always struggle with this. I always break everything with the clip curve. But yeah, that's that's basically that. I think there's not really much more to it. Um, Maybe someday I can make time lapse, lapse of like every piece of material I make. But as I said, I spent quite a long time into sculpting um, like a boulder or a rock. I can even show you my rock I've made for um, the, the pebbles. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, for the hippo place, like these, as I could probably show what I mean with like soft and hard edges. Like this stone is pretty round. But it still has like these aggressive edges here that is like been chiseled off. Um, it has a coat that's a bit smoother, but you know it's it's getting pretty sharp when it goes down again. Like it's a healthy mix of both. It, it's not just aggressive sharp and thin lines. 
Yeah, both of that. Like on here, that's what I always like to do, having like these smoothed out edges, which you can do like even here if you just um, smooth it out with a brush a bit and it already feels a lot less aggressive and you get some nice highlights on there when you bake it out and put some roughness on it. Um, but, it but that depends on what kind of rocks you're making. Like these were tiny pebbles and like bigger boulders that I wanted to mix in the environment. And here I had to kind of think about that I'm going to scale these up and down quite a lot. They're not always going to stay these tiny. Um, so I made sure that I have these big cuts that identify them as rocks, but also when they're scaled down, that they still don't look too busy. Like you can still think like, okay, there are different shapes and um, I don't get overwhelmed by the micro detailing that is going on. But if they're like this big, you're like, okay, yeah, that's uh, not too um, low res either. Um, so yeah, always keep that in mind because uh, if you think about world building as well, I like to scale up my assets up and down a lot <laughs> because sometimes I realize, oh, this might be a nice uh, two meter big uh, pillar. This looks cool. And then I scale it down again to be super tiny. And, you know, you obviously have to have a scale in mind for when you start a project. But I, sh I personally, I'm not too scared to scale things up and down if I feel like this looks cooler now. And I think that's what happens in a lot of games and world building too. Uh, so don't be scared to, you know, change it. <laughs> um, so yeah, going back now into, but if you guys have more questions about sculpting specifically, let me know. Uh, I can always jump back into a Z version demo or something different. Um, but yeah, going back to the text stream because I didn't, I, been just kind of jumping back into it and back out uh, a bit during this. Uh, I've got some key pillars for texturing too. Uh, one big thing for me is color variation. Always add some color variation to it. Like if even if it's super subtle and you know not in your face, <laughs> it's still noticeable. Like it makes a big difference if your gold has like some small hints of red and green, maybe, or just keeping it like solid yellow, like. You might think it's like a very tiny detail, but it makes materials look a lot more alive and uh, interesting to look at. Um, and even when you look at things in real life, they're not just a solid color. Like it's, it, you, you might identify it with the human eye as like brown, but if you go closely up to a tree or even, you know, a wooden board or something, there are different shades of that brown at least. And they're not always like warm or cold. There's like a healthy mix of both. So I would always do that with your materials. Uh, gradients is another big thing. Um, obviously, I think it depends also of the the usability of the asset. You don't want a rock that's uh, you know has a gradient from the bottom to the top. If you're going to rotate this rock like in all directions, it's going to look weird. But for an asset that's always placed in a specific way, it's nice to have a gradient or at least have gradients in the intersecting parts, like in a um, in a cup, for example, you want to have gradients uh, where the lip of the cup is maybe the underneath of it. And this kind of plays back into AO as well. But you can, I would not only rely on the baked AO, I would also add your own AO on top of it with gradients. That's uh, what I like to do. Um, treat your roughness and metal materials uh, well, <laughs> like don't neglect them. I've, I've done that before that I wouldn't really care much about uh, how I treat my roughness and metalness. Um, for some things, it's not noticeable that much uh, sometimes, but I think um, as, as soon as you have a more complex lighting scenario or materials that heavily depend on having uh, an interesting roughness um, treatment, um, it really pays off. And especially with metal, you want to make it like, worth it looking at it like metal is a bit tricky i've struggled with this a lot <laughs> especially inside unreal um with the reflection captures but you want to have uh roughness and um metallic treatments that are varied and um i would say spend as much time as you do for your colors and base color also in your roughness and metallic especially also for stylized stuff like i think uh on first thought people think oh no you don't need to spend too much time on roughness and metallicness for stylized stuff, just put like one metallic value on it and that's fine. I don't think so. Like it's, uh, it's still interesting to have, um, some variation in there too. And, um, 
and, and the final pillar of my thing is that uh, of my texturing process is that add painted touches to like don't just put in the um the curvature or the cavity um generator in there and leave it and that's it like as you can see uh in the top model i did exactly that i didn't paint any of my curvature out i just left it as it is uh and on another example i will show you i actually spent time and you know painted out the curvature on some of the parts that it's not just a continuous ring of curvature going around this asset because that looks again uh very procedural and not handcrafted and my personal like style is that i want things to look um unique and not like that they are just put inside a generator that you know that it's um very rigid looking and i think having uh you know building on top of your sculpt and uh, helping your sculpt to shine is by being also a bit more artistic in your texturing process too um and i will show you that on the example of two things i will also show my plants in a bit but yeah for my uh, infuser um the gem and uh, the gem materials are very simple like they're so tiny i didn't really bother doing much with them but for the um the gold material i can i wanted to show you how i layer my materials um for the base color yeah i just have like a default uh, roughness and metallic value that i like to use for this again this is personal preference. I've heard people say the default value for roughness and metallic in stylized stuff is very set that um, like metallic is at around 0 0.7 and roughness can be like different depending on what you prefer. And that's kind of what I also like to keep uh, in mind when I do things. But as I said, it looks different in every engine, every light scenario. So do what you think. Um, works well in your um, version but what i would never do is you know pull this on full metallic because straight away this looks very tinny and not that appealing and very dark and i i, I don't like this like full-on metallic look so yeah it's always nice to have it at like um 0 0.7 or 0 0.6 um that's my go-to and for the roughness, that's uh, another thing. Like if you pull the roughness at zero, it looks absolutely horrendous. <laughs> and that's what, like, you know, maybe for a realistic material, this could work. But for stylized, you don't want it to be shiny all the time and, uh, you know, go overboard with that. That's why I also keep it at like 0 0.3, something. Yeah, 0 0.3. Um, and then, then we already start with the gradients. My main gradient here, I'll go into base color because that's easier to see. Um, I had at the start a gradient that's just in this uh, in another um, gold brown shade for um, set on additive, uh, just to you know get some variation within the gold first. And then um, I'll just ignore the height uh, things I've done. I'll just go into the colors first. Um, then the AO for the AO, you can see it does a quite a big difference. Uh, I've chose a more greenish tinted color um, because I kind of wanted to play into how metals can oxidate. I know that with gold, like with this gold, I didn't really go into that oxidated look, but I still wanted to give it some hint. And I think um, yellow and this like more coolish green, because this is not a very warm green, as you can tell, very close to being almost turquoise. Um, plays really well with this warm shade like always try to go for warm versus cold that's my general rule in my head um then for the gradients i do the same like for my bottom gradient i went for a very warm uh, red shade um and then for the gradient that's on top it's a coolish uh, purple shade again it's super subtle so yeah you can barely see it but you can see it on here um that it gets a bit cooler and I know that I didn't really apply it to here, but I thought this will add also nice differentiation again between the gold itself, like that maybe the top was exposed more to, you know, light, rain, whatever. And this part of the infuser was kept a bit safe because this is like a little hat for it that, you know, keeps it safe from the rain, maybe. <laughs> um, and then we already go into, um, I think I will do this step last with the, um, with the oxidation and the rust. Um, going back to more of like the height stuff, uh, I do have a height cells um, map on here. It's very subtle. You can barely see it. I will go on here. Maybe you can see it a little bit better. 
it's very subtle yeah like i think barely anyone will see it but in my head i was like yeah you can see it a bit uh i do like to use the cells uh, the ratio cells a lot for stylized stuff i think many people do this but again don't go overboard with it keep it simple keep it very subtle don't depend on it too much um i would rather just go inside zbrush and you know use the hammered um metal brush um or the ones that I've shown you from this artist that are very similar. Uh, if you want to have this like metallic look on so that's hammered, uh, but still like blend it out and not just depend on this ratio cells because you can tell if somebody has been overly using it and it doesn't look very handcrafted anymore. And I always like put a blur on top of it as well. Um, and then for more height information, as I was saying earlier, uh i've got these little damages that also are color variation at the same time they're on top of you can tell here um i first got the light version of it which are these very tiny ones and then i've got the darker ones and these are basically just a uh, um another grunge um map that i just use on top um but yeah you can basically experiment with that as well i do like to use um different grunge maps that are inside um, here and see how well they work. Same goes for the color variations. Um, let me just go here. Ah, yeah. Um, but yeah, jumping back onto my color variations, um, I do also like to use this grunge map for a lot of things. Um, it's a very spotted one. Um, and this one for the, for the color variations, I would also make sure that you um, scale them differently, these like tiled, tiled um, grunge maps, and also paint out some of the details again, like uh, you don't want it everywhere, you just want it like on some places, sorry. As you can see, there's some of the green here, and then some of the orange is like visible in between that, but it's not in your face direct. Like if you, if you would take them away, um, it looks kind of bland. <laughs> um, and I know some might say, oh, you can't really tell the biggest difference, but it still is there. Like, you can still say that this is not just a solid um, orange and that's about it. Like, there is some variation that you can tell. And with that, you can also, even if you want to be um, a bit more uh, invested into your roughness, you can also change the, uh, add like a roughness channel and make that also play into your um, uh, variation as well. And I do like to do that sometimes. Um, and the final thing on here that I like to do, um, is these type of damages. Um, these are also with like, uh, grunge spots that you can use and then bevel them, as you can tell here, um, which is quite nice. Um, and also like have small and bigger variants because they kind of fake the stuff that you could do inside ZBrush, but not Fully, so I would be also be cautious with that. I would not heavily depend on them either. Just maybe if you feel like you need some more um, height variation inside your normal map, to go for it. But don't let this be like the only thing that's um, de determining the normal information. And um, another thing that's here, yeah, the the color variation yeah this is also very uh, straightforward it looks kind of odd in here in my opinion i think it looks nicer like when it's rendered out inside engine uh, here it's very strong the um, oxidation that i've been doing with the gold um but here i just wanted to paint into the inset parts that i sculpted and elevate them a bit and then kind of add to other parts of the model as well where i didn't always sculpt these things um and fill them out basically. And as you can tell, there's also a slight um, um, mask effect around it on here. But yeah, I've been a bit sloppy with this to be honest, because uh, I was on a very tight deadline and <laughs> decided to go a bit too detailed with these props. But yeah, but for what it is from far away, it works well enough and it adds some color variation on top of like the very subtle one. This is more the in your face color variation. Um, uh, besides the very small one that you have in the strong colors here. Um, but yeah, that, that's the thing. Like I usually just like to 
layer these things. And as you can tell, I've got a lot of these different damage, uh, small damage, light damage, big. It's just for me to sometimes see maybe I don't want to have this one anymore, or maybe I do, but like having these little hits of uh, dark spots on this model inside the color and the height um, really pay off. Um, and then I'm just checking the chat a second. I would love to know how you do tree trunk scopes. I'm making some now and having trouble getting the sharp plane transitions like your reference shows. Mine looks more round. Um, do you mean, let me just go back on my slides. Uh, do you mean like this type of uh, transition here where um, the trunks are basically, um, the, where the in, it goes, goes inside and outside, it's a bit hard to explain. Um, but yeah, I can definitely pull out my file for that and explain some stuff for that after the um, texturing thing. <laughs> um, just going back inside, just to wrap it up quickly on this side. Um, because I wanted to just quickly show also what I've done for this arch, because here I really liked um, the way I've done like some extra damage on the bottom of it, because these, as you can tell, are again, these typical um, mask um, masking techniques that I've been showing inside ZBrush. But when I um, was texturing this and also putting it inside Engine, I realized that um, it's a bit too simple. Like it looks a bit too forced in this case. I think for metal and um, uh, and yeah, metal what I've been showing before, it works well. But for this type of concrete stuff, I kind of um, think it was a bit too graphic. Uh, and too simple, so I wanted to add something on top of that, and that's why I've done inside um, here with some uh, grunge leak uh, uh, texture. Um, and here I've also been adding like a lot of like bevels, blurs, uh, slope, and paint, and another bevel on top of it, so it looks a bit more stylized and not too um, realistic. Because if you turn off all of these. Uh, it like it, it doesn't really work. Um, it's not what I've wanted to achieve with it. But then, if you start masking out, you know the very like micro detail stuff that's going on here with some uh, blur slope and like maybe painting it out as well, and then beveling it at the end. I think I've got a fairly nice result that blends well with these very big details and. Um, balances it out of it. So you have again, like the small detailing and the big detailing, thin lines and thick lines. And um, I think that worked fairly well for this type of uh, material. And this one was just basically adding like a lighter layer on top. So it doesn't look just flat. Um, in hindsight, I think I could have also just done the same like I've done on the rust where you have the inside with the mask a bit uh, lighter and the edges light darker, but I just thought this looks, um, that this works fair enough as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, the only thing I've done differently on here, that's what I wanted to showcase, is how I've done my curvature. Uh, because on metal, on some of these metal things, like on here, the curvature is not really that strong that you would be like, oh yeah, I can see this continuous curvature just wrapping around this asset. But on this one, um, I think you could have like, sort of see it a bit better, and especially for this type of solid gold um, asset, I thought I should spend some more time into um, making it look a bit more interesting in the material treatment, especially because the scale of this is very different to a little infuser. Uh, and what I do just basically, I think you all probably know this as well, you can just add a paint layer on top and either paint out some of the cavity or curvature or paint some on top of it. And that's what exactly what I've done. I've done some manual um, curvature painting on this, uh, just to make it look less, um, yeah, procedural. And I think it's very subtle, but it still, um, gives this model a bit of a nicer end result in my opinion, at least. Um, but yeah, other than that, this is the same setup as before. I just always have a colored AO. Um, I do some height, very subtle height information. I've used the same technique as for the little hit dam damages uh, on here as well. And um, yeah, as you can see, it's the same layer again, where I have the different color variations and my uh, gradients um, 
that I just add to here. Like for here example, um, I've baked this out in separate baking groups because I wanted to use this arch maybe in a different scenario too. For for this uh, asset, I really wanted to have like this extra amount of AO on the intersecting part with the pillar. Um, same goes for this little gem thing or having like some um, um, gradient on the middle of it like the, the kind of faking like the baked lighting in this because I would that's why I've been doing a lot with my hand painted stuff where I would fake the lighting I'll just have all of the lighting in the diffuse already and I've tried to do the same in PBR by sometimes just you know exaggerating a bit the lights to dark areas to also pinpoint um, where the the focus or interest is in this asset and when it's placed in the environment that this part is like more shiny and um, uh, interesting uh, or noticeable for the viewer than the bottom of this asset. Um, let me just check on the chat again. And I will not forget about the tree. I will get back to the tree. Um, will you ever sell one of your scenes on the Unreal Marketplace and some source files on a place like ArtStation, like the low poly, the scope, the painter file? Um, yes, I think I would like to do this. I've been thinking about it a lot recently. Um, I might do this in the new year because this year I'm very packed with some stuff. Um, but yeah, I would love to do that and, um, release some of, either release some of my current files or make like an entire new project where I can, um, be a bit more tidy about it as well, I think, and, uh, feel comfortable to, um, publish it but yeah I would like to do that for sure because I personally also learn a lot from those uh, type of resources people pull out. Um, how long does a prop take to complete like maybe the arch versus the infuser? Um, the arch I always kind of um, allocate maybe a day for texturing um, then a day or half a day for like sculpting and then um, the texturing and retopo phase kind of tie into each other. So as I said before, maybe a day to two days for that. Um, so for the arch, I would say it was maybe two to three days in total. Um, but then I've got to say with this arch, it went through some iterations because I realized midway, that's again on like poor planning maybe that I could have done it a bit easier or could have like reused this arch in some other ways. That's why I had to go back into my block out and change some things. So it took longer than it should have, but the actual scope of it was uh, very straightforward and quick to do. Uh, for the infuser, I think this infuser took in total also three days. I think, yeah, it was roughly three days. Um, but I had to rush this because uh, I had to do the other, inf this um, candle thing as well. Uh, so I think these two together took a week in total. That's how I uh, try to restrain myself basically from spending too much time on it because it was at the end of my project and I still wanted some nice hero props. So I said, okay, I'm going to spend a week on both of these. And if I get done, that's fine. If not, I'll just take one that's uh, finished. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps. The, the thing is I did get faster since then and it really depends on like you know what the outside influences are as well like if you get feedback from people if this is just a personal project if you get feedback from uh tutor versus you know friends and with this project i kind of uh, got a lot of feedback at the to like the 80 percent stage of the project and at the end i was just like i need to go through this super fast because my deadline is next week <laughs> Um, so it's, uh, kind of took less time than maybe something would take in production, but sometimes in production, you also need to rush things because of other reasons. So yeah, it's, it's hard for me sometimes to pinpoint specific days because I don't want people to think that they need to be just as fast or that they are being too slow or too fast. It's kind of, um, a difficult thing for me to sometimes estimate for others because everyone has a different way of doing things or has a different time frame they can spend on things, um, if that makes sense. Um, how strict are you with your personal work deadlines? Um, do you have them for every project? Um, I do like to keep my projects um, 
kind of short-ish. Like I think the longest personal project I've had was two months, um, which was the case with uh, the marketplace. But this one was also a big learning experience. So I kind of let myself take a long time with this. Um, with the other ones, I did set myself deadlines because I sometimes reach like a dead point in a project where I'm like, okay, I'm just fixing very unnecessary things and I need to move on with this. And when I realized that I um, just kind of stop and I would say all of these projects were roughly in the same amount of time, like either one to two months. But now that I'm also working uh, full time because back in university it was like part time work, part time uni, um, well, slash full time uni. <laughs> um, I had to be kind of fast about it, but now with work and other life responsibilities, uh, I don't have a deadline anymore. <laughs> like now I'm just like, if I finish the project this year, that's fine. If I don't, that's also fine. <laughs> like, I don't want to burn myself out uh, if it's not necessary anymore right now. And it, it was never necessary. Let's just say that it's never necessary or needed to burn yourself out of a project. Don't do that. It's not worth it. Take your time. And don't get too irritated by maybe, as I said, if somebody else is faster at doing something than you are, because that's what used to make me very um, self-conscious. Uh, but at the end of the day, you will get faster. And if you take a bit longer than other people, that's completely fine. Uh, it's about how you do things and how you approach things. And if you get something out of it and not how others um, are like faster or slower than you, I think. Um, but yeah, let's jump back. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, just a quick rundown on my, because I've touched on the foliage and my ZBrush as well. Um, again, the foliage is probably the quickest thing to texture. I think I've done all of my foliage uh, cards in one day uh, from sculpt to texturing. Um, obviously, the assembly part is another day because I need to actually sit and make um, interesting plant shapes out of these um, alphas. But for these, as you can see, the layers, I didn't even bother naming some of these. That's what I mean. I need to make actual projects that have like nice naming conventions on the substance uh, files. But with this one, I just wanted to be, again, very quick and effective where I have the similar setup as of my other props, but without the metallic um, channel. This one does have roughness variation, if you look. A uh, very um, subtle one um, on the edges, again. This is also debatable. You don't have to do this, but I just thought on the edges, it might be nice to have that because maybe the leaf is a bit wet there or the texture of the leaf um, might be different uh, on the, inter uh, on the um, edges or in the cavities. That was my reasoning. And then I also used my go-to brunch map on this again, just to add some very subtle uh, roughness variations. You can see it's slightly there, but um, not fully. Um, but yeah, I don't do anything very special in these cases either. I do a lot of like gradient, uh, manual gradient painting in these, uh, only like on the inset parts I did uh, actual fill layer um, of a gradient, but all of them are in the end just painted in and out because that's a lot easier to do than playing around with the positional uh, gradient thing. That would be easy with a prop, but not so easy with um, these tiny things where it might look a bit too forced if you have like these top to bottom gradients. Just do it a bit more organically, I would say, for these. Um, and uh, going back to the trees, if there's not any specific questions for the substance side, um, give me a second to open the file for that because that's because actually what I do like, and that's I think maybe helpful for people. I save a lot of like separate uh, ZPR files of my trees and to just compare um, how I've got to the results that I've done. Um, just to compare between them. Okay. Okay, so for my trees, uh, I think as many of you probably do that as well, I use these spheres for the shapes. Um, this is great for actually having an organic tree that grows maybe, especially around a structure. Um, again, maybe trees could be done in a different way, like just with tiling textures, um, or entirely for a spine system, but, um, I kind of subconsciously did these trees in a good way that I could reuse them a lot inside the environment. And I did texture them all uniquely, but 
in the end, I just had uh, two unique tree trunks, and then I kind of Frankenstein them into vi veins, uh, into vines, sorry, uh, and into like um, and, and fed them into my spine system. So it was pretty nice to work with these. Uh, but yeah, you first start off with these spheres, and then after that, when I see um, remesh them into actual 3D models, this was like the first phase because you can see this one didn't have any treatment yet, but this one I was purely using uh, the clay tubes brush um, and was doing this, I can demo it on the other tree where I would just do these very flowy uh, vein-like shapes, change the size of it, and then build up like different heights in there so it's not all just on one layer. Um, as you can see here, so you have this nice lip um and then you go in with the page polish and then smooth it out a bit to have like these uh valleys basically and then i also used a lot of dam standards to define the valleys actually because they get lost a bit if you um use h polish like this and don't worry in this stage that it looks ugly and uh, pixely because um, I will dynamesh this and then uh, refine it again. But at the start, you shouldn't think about any of the micro detail, like nothing. It's just about the shapes. It's just about you using the tubes brush and um, building up the detail. Uh, and I think you just got to decide how you want the vines to um, kind of flow inside the tree. For that, I did look at some references of actual trees and tried to group in my head, okay, um, they shouldn't go just straight down. Like, uh, it's kind of difficult to do that, to be honest, because you don't want like this, um, you don't want to go like, oh yeah, I'll paint out this like this and then like this, so they're all like beside each other all times. No, you want to like pretend that they're going behind and then they twist back to the front a bit like this. So you have like, the directions change. It's not always like into one direction. You wanted to keep it dynamic and interesting to look at. Not that because if you're already spending time to sculpt the tree and not using a tiling texture, that make you should make it worth your time. <laughs> Basically, that you are actually spending time in giving the tree some nice uh, shape language, and the same goes for the texture. Um, but yeah, in this case, I would always try to change your brush size. And then build them up a bit, and then you can also um no, I don't want to do this. Um, but yeah, that's basically what I've been doing. Trim dynamic is also sometimes nice for this to smooth it out. And then you can... oh, yeah, I would that that's basically that. That's like the first step after you have your model ready, and then I can jump back into what it looked like next. Um, there you can see that it's already a bit higher also in the active points and now I started to define the valleys and the, the planar shapes a bit better again with um, going in with um, the trim dynamic uh, with alt uh, while you're holding alt to fill this and then smooth it out again same goes for here we have to be careful if you do it too fast you have this very bumpy looking sides on the and um they can start defining this more because you get these nice beveled edges from doing all this stuff that i've been explaining with the um play tubes because they kind of organically start beveling out in this way and then you can start refining those bevels a bit better with uh, the trim brushes um and then the next step for this was adding a bit more detail and that's what I've been doing here by adding like some thinner um, valleys into here also maybe like breaking up the straight lines on there by you know carving out some uh, chips and stuff like that and I, what I love doing is uh, using the inflate brush uh, in flat um, and doing like these little chunky um, muscles on trees and then with that you can also try you know exaggerate maybe the uh, valleys that you've painted out that it, maybe you don't want them to be super sharp and you want them to look a bit more chunky and then you can straight away do that by you know just slightly touching <laughs> the um, shapes that you already sculpted out 
Um, but after that, basically, when you have your main viney like shapes in there, you can start just refining them or either uh, accentuating them or make them disappear a bit with um, the detailing that you want to do. And at the end, this was basically like the, the end stage. Um, I tried to add like some extra cuts in there, um, like on top of the ones that I already added beside the ones that I've uh, sculpted out in the blockout stage and um, just clean things up and uh, see where you want, um, again, you want the um, viewer of this asset to look at straight away. And I thought because the temple will be in the middle of this, I'm actually hiding it now, it's already deleted here. Because it was in the middle of this, I wanted to keep the focus also in the middle. That's why I've spent a lot more time into defining the curves of this side and these sides instead of like the little leggies of this tree. <laughs> and same goes for the top. I've blended it out a bit because I knew it's going to either be stuck inside a rock or I'm going to put plants on top of it. So just try to gauge where you want your detail to be seen and where you don't want it to be, to be there. And the, the back, I've done the same because I will wanted to use them on both sides. I spent some time there as well, just to um, flesh out some of the um, vine, viney details. Um, another thing I also did, I just um, wanted to show that. Same with what I've been saying with the in-flat brush, you can also do a, a subtraction of it and it gets you these nice um, smooth valleys that, you've, that I've been doing in a more harsher way with the clay tubes. Or this helps like maybe defining the um, muscle parts in the negative space a bit better, that it's not just coming out all the time, that you're also um, rounding it off a bit. And it's quite nice, actually, if you do it very lightly, you can get um, some really pretty um, shapes on there and then refine them a bit with a pinch, maybe like this, that so you can have these sharper edges and the bigger lip in the middle again. Um, but yeah, I hope this clears up the tree question. Um, <laughs> if you have any other questions about them, let me know. Uh, trees are a bit tricky, but yeah, just try to keep it organic. If that's the style you're going for, of course, like I'm sure there's also very sharp and aggressive looking trees, like I've been saying with the rocks and the wood, but for my personal style, I did like, I do like to keep the materials that are very organic in their nature, um, more friendly looking and then have some other things that are a bit more um, yeah, in your eye and uh, very sharp on the edges and bevels. Um, another question, I have recently found myself getting stuck in a loop of making small changes and adjustments to my work, mostly in sculpting. Uh, would you have any tips to stop wasting time doing unnecessary changes? Apologies if this is a question, if this is not worded, it was. no, it's worded, great, don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah, I do feel you. Like, I think this comes with time. I, I used to spend a lot of time also doing um, this type of micro detail, like you can see on this tree. I would like sit there and be like, oh, okay, yeah, I need to do this now on this this edge as well. And um, not brush. I need to like do it here. I need to do it here. And then I need to do it here and there. Like, you kind of, I think when you, um, when you're a bit newer to sculpting, you tend to be, too much focus on the detailing um, and same goes for other aspects of your project. I think when uh, it's it's been like your second or third time doing these things, you're still in this, uh, this phase of creating art where you're getting to know things and um, it, it gets hard to understand when should I stop, when is it too little, when is it too much. Um, I think what's good in that case is maybe, especially for sculpting, taking a decimated version of your sculpt and then putting it in the scene that it's supposed to be in. Like, don't think about free topo or anything, not textures. Just just put in this the, the gray decimated version of your tree, for example, into the scene and look at it and be like, okay, do these sculpted details um, really play into uh, how this tree is perceived? Um, is it necessary for me to add even more details to this? Or maybe can I just do this inside Substance Painter later on if I think it's necessary? Um, or does it look a bit too bland and it's actually not really tree looking at all? Like I'm missing a lot of the um, cuts and um, maybe uh, valleys inside the trunk texture. Um, 
I think that's that's one thing that can help that actually putting things into context. Um, on the other hand, uh, I would just say don't stress yourself out too much. What's when is the right um, time to stop or continue? Um, as I said, I think this comes a lot with time and practice. Or just send it maybe to a friend or like on here on the Discord. Um, just send it like inside a um, work in progress channel and be like, hey guys, I'm a bit um, unsure about this. Do you think this is uh, okay or should I continue adding more details to this? I think if you're already asking yourself is it, if, it's, uh, if you're getting to an unnecessary stage of detailing, that might be a good sign that maybe your good feeling is right and you should stop and maybe uh, move on to another thing or move on to another prop and come back to it again and look at it and maybe you'll realize oh this was actually okay and i didn't need to add anything else to it and i was just in this you know tunnel vision of sculpting for five hours and <laughs> thought that it's not enough yet so um but yeah i just saw tim also saying it, it, it definitely comes with experience uh, so don't worry about it um uh, I find it interesting to hear that you, um, Jasmine, in this case, uh, talking about deadline and relevancy to this because it creates a sense of urgency and to, urgency to no. Yeah, it definitely does. Like I think uh, with this project, especially because I was an external deadline, like not my self-imposed deadline, I was a lot more anxious about um, if I'm making it in time, if I'm spending too much time on it. And that already forces you to stop when it's necessary to stop. <laughs> and that's also when I learned a lot of my shortcuts or smart way, like quote unquote, smart ways to do things and not worry too much about, um, you know, uh, painting something for five hours or sculpting a detail for five hours if nobody is going to actually see it in the um, final scene. Let me just go in here. Like if you look at a big environment like the hippo scene, at the end of the day, not many people are going to call me out for being like, oh, did you actually spend time on painting out the curvature on this? And that's like, as a whole image like this, it works. But then if you go into like the detail shots and things like that, I did want to make it count. So I had to be mindful about my own way of working and if I'm capable of um, being fast and also efficient at the same time. And situations like that kind of force you to be that way. And it's it's helpful. and stressful but <laughs> at the end you'll um, learn a lot from it um i may have missed it but how do you texture your plants and substance painter um i can i i can just go over it again quickly because it's very easy and um yeah not <laughs> that exciting to be honest uh the main thing i do is just uh, make sure when you bake um your plants onto a plane uh, that you also paint the polygroups that you have inside ZBrush because that will help you a lot to mask them out very clean um, for your alphas, just as a um, forward in this case. Uh, but for the texturing itself, it's the same process as for all of my other props. I use the same um, smart material I made for myself, which is consisting of a base color, having a gradient that either goes from bottom to top or in some cases are just existent in the middle of the plant because um for the plants maybe you want to you know um rotate this leaf the other way around and then it, it's it, it gets a bit tricky having the gradient just on the bottom but in my case i just wanted to keep these plants one way rotated because also the um, stem is sculpted in this way um oh yeah that's the gradient part for this one i always also like to use again the same we're having a more warmish green and then a blue for the dark uh, accentuation in the uh, colors. And I also, again, have the color variation that's um, in a lighter and a more um, colorful uh, green, and like a more turquoise in this case. That's also cool. And this one also plays into the roughness as well, as you can see here. Um, with these plants, I had to be a bit careful. I spent very little time on actually um, uh, painting in these because I realized that again, for the amount I'm using them inside the scene, it would get very busy looking if I will paint a lot of extra details into them. Um, especially with plants, uh, or you, uh, like in this case, I use a normal map, which was fine and it works really well because these plants need a normal map. 
for, uh, especially for things like grass, which is like super repetitive. You don't need any normal map or much painting or detailing at all because it will just look very repetitive and very noisy quickly. That's why I like to keep plants super simple. And this was already like very detailed for my uh, standards of making plants. Um, so I would uh, definitely try to not go overboard with it. Like even with the curvature, I kept it very subtle. Like you can barely see it uh, because I had it at one point very strongly there. Um, but like, as you can see, I actually was just using a old curvature that I didn't even use. Don't, don't copy my way of um, <laughs> doing my layers in this one. Um, but with curvature especially, I toned it down a lot because I had it very strongly inside engine. Also, the painted details, I had them at some point and it just looked weird having, you know, a very detailed environment and then having very detailed plants as well. Like, you got to decide where you want to put your detail in. and I personally think for plants you should keep it on the low side because plant these plants are not existing as one leaf at a time they're existing in bunches uh, duplicated over and over again and um, that's going to show if you're going to have uh, these uh, unique details painted on them in my opinion at least um, but yeah as you can see I painted a lot of the gradients as well so most of this is gradient work having a nice green base color, adding some color variations to your different leaves and a very subtle uh, roughness variation as well. For roughness for plants, um, I think that's also the thing where people maybe have different opinions on how to treat the roughness of it. Um, but I like to keep it um, very, uh, like almost a bit plasticky looking. Uh, not, not, like not too much, like if it would be super plastically, you would, um, you know, it would look, wrong and kind of like a toy but you still want a very subtle uh sheen look to it but not too much that it looks wet and reflective all the time obviously if it's in a wet cave or something yeah you can make them look a bit more shiny but then in that case don't make them look shiny everywhere make use of your roughness channels and um, add some variation where there's areas of rest and areas of um, interest again like this applies i think to every prop but especially for plants be mindful of that um, I hope that was somewhat um, helpful <laughs> for the plants aspect. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, but yeah, I think I've done a lot of like separate um, explanation routes with this uh, workshop right now. I hope it wasn't too much all over the place because I tried to incorporate a lot of the uh, things I do into each other because that's how I work as well. Like I don't... I like to jump around a lot and um, swap around my um, workflows and what I'm doing. And that's just the way I work. So I hope it was somewhat informative. And um, yeah, if you have any other questions, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to answer any of the questions you guys have in the chat. And I will definitely also stay, I think, another 10 minutes after uh, 7 p.m. because we started later too, so that everyone um, can you know, get the time worth of uh, content <laughs> in this too. But yeah, thank you for listening. And yeah, that's, that's all from me. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for taking the time to present this awesome workshop. Make sure to check out her work in the description below. Also, a big thanks for all of our amazing Patreon supporters for making it happen in the first place. These workshops are funded because of your support. If you want to participate in upcoming workshops, are interested in growing your career as an environment artist, or are just looking to improve your artistic skills, you can head over to beyondaccent.com where you can access our community and a whole bunch of other resources to help you expand your environment art journey. See you there!